Give us any chance, we'll take it. Read us any rule, we'll break it. We're gonna make our dreams come true. Welcome to the Nash United Podcast about eight seasons in a row. I'm Lisa Fernandes and... And, uh, yeah, uh, I'm Chris Drywardner. Uh, uh, hello. Oh, you know your Jeff Goldblum impression drives me crazy. Uh, this is Watch the Fur Fly from Season 7 of Over and Shirley. Directed by Jack Winter and written by Bob Howard. Chris probably has facts about them both coming up. Oh, yeah. We have broken the Tom Trevich streak after many, many, many episodes. Yeah, many, many episodes. Yeah, now it's in Season 6, I think, maybe. Yeah, it feels like he's been directing the show for 556 million episodes. But this is some new blood from Jack Winter, newish blood from Jack Winter. And he's Mm going to be popping in and out uh, for the rest of the season. Mm Mm-hmm. Though uh, there are many episodes left to go with Mr. Trubovich and lots of uh, surprises coming up. Uh, d- d- a d- d- asterisks yeah. may not actually include prizes. We'll, we'll try to get you something in the Crocker Jack box that does this show. <laughs> there, there you go. <laughs> something somewhere. <laughs> and here's the episode's about. The first relationship with handsome interpreter Jeffrey is going well. Mostly because she's lied to him that she's multilingual with seven spoken languages at her disposal. Laverne decides to take a crash course in multiple languages for a big party, but cops out by taping multiple notes all over her body and only memorizing certain key phrases. Shelly finds Laverne's lying incredibly hypocritical until the animal lover discovers that she's been set up for the party with a furrier. Both girls desperately try to keep their facades up, but soon find themselves outmatched by their own moral codes and lack of skill. Elsewhere, Shirley and Ron's fight over a spray-painted bowling ball turns into a discussion about fox stoles. What do you think about this one? Well, I gotta say, uh, when it comes to uh, episodes about furries, I was surprised there weren't more foxtails. No, but seriously, this was a goofy episode, but with a surprising, interesting, poignant point at the end, which I was very happy with them pulling off. So there's some great highlights in this episode. I think it's great to see... After the last couple of episodes, that uh, this is a really good Penny and Cindy showcase in particular. Yes. Uh, for the both of them together in their chemistry. The whole opening of Goldblum coming in with her and they're doing, you know, and, and that's the thing also, by the way, Penny and Jeff's chemistry yes. is fantastic. Yes. Uh, yes. Jeff, Jeff Goldblum wins over the audience as uh, yes. the very unoriginally titled Jeffrey. Yes. Pretty much instantaneously. Yes. And this then episode, the whole... Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, sorry, no, sorry. You, go, you go ahead, actually. This episode takes place at a very interesting time in his career. It does. We're post-invasion of the body snatchers and 10-speed and brown shoes, and we're just pre-Big Chill in his resume. Exactly. Yeah, uh, Big Chill and Right Stuff, back-to-back. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yep, 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 back-to-back. And that would start launching him more and more in, as a leading man, and he would start taking more and more big roles, and that would yep. just... Lead to... Totally yeah, launch like, him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, for a cowboy named New Jersey, not too bad. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yep, 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 yep. Buckaroo Bonds, I was ahead for him as well. Mm-hmm. Which, that I film. mean, was not a success. That film was like a cult, yeah. you know, it was a bad flop, yeah, but yeah, that movie's yeah, awesome, yeah. and I love it. Yes, and I got to see it yes. in 35mm yeah. a few months before this recording, and I love it. Yep. But, yeah, uh, him and Penny's chem- chemistry is fantastic. And yes. then Cindy integrating into it by... Jumping, thinking, misinterpreting yes. the playful wrestling foreplay yes. as a uh, attack. Uh, my yes. note is uh, Shirley goes full Irish, save the fam, attacking. <laughs> this is so great. His wry reaction to that is both very Jeff Goldblum and very good. Yes, it's really fun. And he likes pro wrestling. He's very good. <laughs> and I also do love the uh, trying to shoo them away. Like, why don't you continue what you were doing? Whatever it was. And it, my note is, don't don't you lie, Shirley. You want to watch. Yeah. Voyeur Shirley. Uh, you know, Voyeur Shirley has not popped up in a while, but uh, yeah. it's. It, don't think I forgot that the, those again. references in seasons three, four, three and four. What the heck is going on with this outfit? Like, really? I mean, it's a nice outfit. I'm not gonna. <laughs> I'm not gonna knock it. Uh, you know, it's it. The thing is, I do like many types of green. Green is my favorite color, so that's that's gonna be a yeah. thing. I really like um I really like almost everything else that's going on in wardrobe in this season, but this is like Laverne's worst outfit and we're constantly resubjected to it <laughs> over and over again. Uh I love Jeff Goldblum's massive amount of hair here. That's so cool. As as somebody who uh, currently has a lot of hair, I I uh, definitely appreciate that. Yeah. Um wrestling is foreplay here. 
wrestling is foreplay. Very cute. Uh, love it. I especially love the chemistry and the way that Jeff delivers a line. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They're clearly having fun, like, lightly flirting, just dancing the night away, so to speak, verbally. Mm-hmm. Surely jumping in to save everybody, and then Rhonda having an opinion that she, as she enters. Like, she... I, once again, people say Shirley Feeney is too delicate to fight anybody, and I'm like, she could punch Ricky, Richie Cunningham out with one fist right to the face. Oh, yeah. She could kill you if she needed to. And think of all the scuffles and such that does happen in canon. I mean, we're talking like um, uh, yeah. Dating Slump and uh, and others that, uh, yeah. and, you know, she was... Moose Jaw. Moose Jaw. There you go. Great, great. Another great yeah, example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is absolutely canonical. It's absolutely canonical for her to be that tough. Mm-hmm. So Laverne announces her foolish idea here, which is massively foolish even for her. Yeah. Just put all the notes everywhere. Just lie and lie to everybody. Yeah, just... Surely they will think you're a native speaker. Oh my god, yeah. The, the, this whole... Because um, that's the interesting thing I find about the premise of this episode is that it, it it's a very good execution. It's a very cute execution of one of the worst tropes to me, I should say in sitcoms and kid shows and this sort of type of stuff because it, i you know again this is a trope of the 70s 80s sitcom that really carried over to a lot of nickelodeon shows that i watched as a kid and it's it's like ah the, the, you know you gotta have the it's cringe humor and i don't like it yeah i don't like it uh like for me it's the vague racism going on with the our friends from foreign lands feeling yeah she's trying hard and this is but this is also the easy way out in a lot of ways Oh, certainly. And she just lied that I don't know one language. Yep. I mean, that's that's what I and many others say is like the only language I know is English. And I know it very badly, <laughs> you know. But yeah, it's it's lies to make it's the whole lies to make one more appealing. Um, I do like the exchange of, you know, it's like, I- I'll just, you know, it'll be just like I crammed for high school Spanish. It's like you flunked. No, I got an incomplete. I didn't turn in my pinata project. Yeah, yeah. It's like putting it's like actually this is what it's like. It's like frying a bunch of soup of peas and sitting there in a serape and then doing terrible accents. And as someone who's Latina and has seen that happen at my very white, like, elementary school, that was an experience. I bet. That was an experience, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 1980s kids. Yeah. <laughs> like, Laverne is well meaning here. In that, you know, she wants to relate to all these people, but she doesn't want to, you know, put in the uh, in work because she probably can't do the work. Linguistics just aren't her thing. Mm-hmm. And, like, you know, she surely tries desperately to push the handbrake here, but Laverne insists upon not doing so. Ergo mess. Yep. Ergo mess. And Russian smut for travelers, apparently. Dostoevsky after dark. Yes. I, I, I do love Shirley's Molotov cocktail joke, though. Yeah, and then gingerly you toss one on a passerby, and then when he goes up in flames, you can casually bring up, you know, uh, you know, how did he get set on fire? It's like you have to think about these pa- these passphrases, and we're gonna be able to use them, Liver. Mm-hmm. It's like, but she knows like the right phrases to memorize. Where's the bathroom? Mm-hmm. Yeah, all the basics, the little kind of linguistic basics. She just doesn't, you know, she just puts the notes all over herself instead, and ultra ultra mess in the end, ultra mess in the end. Yeah. It's it's another. It, I was actually kind of surprised that even though it's another one of these episodes that devolves into mess and etc., uh, the scope of the chaos was not as large as I expected it to be. Yeah, yeah. I actually spe- expected um, her to bump into more people. Actually, what would have really been funny is maybe she masters a couple of the basics in each language. She masters just some of the basics without notes at all. Yeah. And then she goes to the party, it's going great, and then she bumps into somebody that speaks something really obscure, like Tagalog, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. something like that. Oh, yeah, or Tamil so, or something, you know, yeah. or, uh... Yeah, yes, yes. Or, or even Latin. Latin, yeah. Even the dead language that is Latin. Exactly. And then she has no idea what to do. <laughs> that would have been better. Yeah, oh, yeah. That would have been better than this. Yeah. Because the thing that, I, you know, that has come up a lot through Season 7, and will continue to come up through Season 7 from the episodes I've seen after this... There's a lot of Laverne is the butt of the joke. It used, I kind of miss how silly things would happen to uh, like around them. And here it's more of a to them because of them being a, being dumb. And it so it feels more yeah. like, haha, you're the dumb kid. I'm going to point my finger and laugh at you. And so it, as you're saying, like the idea of like, OK, I've got it. I got it. Everything's cool. And then you turn the corner oh, God, I don't know how to deal with this situation. That's, the, you know, it's a different situation than you expect. It's like the uh, 
you quizzed your you've prepped for everything except the subjects that are going to be on the test yeah 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 you cram and you cram as hard as you can but if there's a gap you know you fall into the gap exactly you melt you dissolve and that's what ends up happening to laverne because there's only so much you can do exactly yeah, and and it's uh, I did think it was very cute that at the end uh, there's the and it's and it's funny how kind of simple it is at the very end where uh, Goldblum uh you know as Jeff uh Jeffrey he mentions yeah. he figured it out pretty early in the evening but he didn't hold it against her because I think he no. could see that she was trying. And she was yeah. she was still very sweet, and he still gets along with her really well. And yeah. sort of like, yeah, yeah. In another date yeah. or two, he's going to have the conversation of, you know, you don't need to tell me, you don't need to try to impress me. You already are yeah. impressive as it is. You don't need to go out of your way. Yeah, yeah, it was really sweet. Uh, and that's not bad for a girl who got incomplete in high school Spanish. Like, oh that yeah, ain't bad. Oh yeah, totally. It's really, really sweet that he doesn't give a darn. Like, and maybe he could teach her. Maybe that could be a thing. Uh, that would have been awesome. I'm I'm saddened that Jeff is not a regular yeah. guy in the show because his chemistry is yeah. amazing in this. Yeah, yeah, we never see him again, tragically. Yeah, that's what's sad. So, who is the bigger hypocrite here, Laverne or Shirley? I'm gonna go with Shirley, to be honest. Yeah, I'm absolutely because yeah. the 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 yeah. fur thing. Because yeah. you know the we we didn't do a you know a huge deep dive onto the synopses of this of of how it this episode does a really good job of establishing how disgusted and disturbed Shirley is by the concept of of the fur industry, uh, yeah. and and to be honest, like I feel very much yeah. the same way. We have gotten to the point where like if you're in a remote location, you know, trying to survive for your life, I get it. You know, but we don't when you live in a modern contemporary society, you don't need to skin animals like this. You know, pleather's fine. And they did this really good job of establishing it, then having her go back on it so hard yeah. twice, yeah. no less. Yeah. Yeah. Is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, th that that it's not a good look. Yeah. We never see Shirley sell her integrity out this hard. You can't usually. Yeah, usually. Yeah, I, I yeah. And this is a value that Cindy Williams actually had. Mm -hmm. The reason why Shirley's an animal activist, and the reason why Shirley loves animals, is because Cindy loves animals. And I think Cindy is either uh, either did stuff for PETA, she did something for the Humane Society at one point. But she was very into animal activism, mm -hmm. and it's like, gee, it's kind of mean about how you know Shirley will just you know sell herself out to the highest bidder as long as she has a cute guy in front of her. This episode and an affair to forget in a way are very cynical in two totally different ways about how the girls uh, perceive romance, even though they say Laverne's romantic in that one. But we'll get there. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Regarding uh, quickly to jump back to the Cindy thing, as you were mentioning, I, I decided to go ahead yeah. and do a quick check. In 2011, Cindy Williams was in a play that basically yes. what she did is after each curtain call, she would go up on stage and introduce a dog from the no-kill Animal Haven shelter. And Aww. that basically was to try to get members of the audience to adopt a dog or adopt an animal. Aww. And Aww. Uh, sure, yeah. apparently there were some that did. Hey. So That's good stuff. That's good to hear. And that's very, very, very her from what I can understand. So that is beautiful and very sweet. Cindy has a thing for animals, as uh, Penny once said. <sighs> like the pro animal message here is very cute. Rhonda and uh, Shirley's conversation is very cute. It's so incredibly cute. Yeah, it's like where how do does Rhonda not know where fur comes from? Well, remember though, it's it's uh, secondhand, and then uh, eventually yeah. it's like, well, Rhonda, you know, what was it? Uh, if I known it was going to get fur, I would have asked for a Siberian mink. Yeah. <laughs> God, this girl. <laughs> I love this girl. I don't know how she manages to be fantastically naive and fantastically cynical at the same time. Yeah, Rhonda, Rhonda what has evolved into an... Like, they figured out those two tones from season six, yes. and they figured out how to make that a complete character. And yeah. I and, yeah. and Leslie yeah. especially just bring like yeah, because Leslie's performance in this little scene and the whole like, you know, me, yes. me, 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 you know, with the little fur. Yes. It's so... Yeah. Oh, God. She is, and I mean this in the, be the best way, she's like a human Miss Piggy. That is incredibly accurate. Yeah, I would. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, m my mother has actually been so endeared to Rhonda. She's now jokingly mentioning, talking about herself in the third person now. Yeah. <laughs> really? really? 
Yeah. The, Your mom's doing she, it? she did that. She did it twice today. I mean, she 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 oh, she God. then mentions like, oh, you know, like Rhonda. So I mean, it's not. I don't know how much is gonna stick, but we'll see. Your mom's name is using the blender. Your mom's name is turning the television set off. Right. <laughs> oh my goodness. But yeah. Oh. Uh, and how how long will it take before you run screaming out of the room? With reaction to this is my question. Um. It's, we'll, we'll yeah. just, you know, I, I, um, you know, uh, yeah, it, maybe it, it, here's, here's, here's what I'm going to say. Where's your parent? Yeah. I yeah. plead the fifth for reasons of yeah. consci- conscientious objector. <laughs> yeah. 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 I know how that goes with my father as long as. Uh, so, uh, so when we get to the, the, um, so for okay, actually, before I'm looking over my notes. Okay, so before we jump away from the Ronda scene, I do want to mention I love that there's that wonderful close up of Boo Boo Kitty. Yes, it specifically happens after um, uh, Shirley tells Boo Boo Kitty not to look at her on her face. Yeah, <laughs> and I think in the script it specifically mentions as we move from Boo Boo Kitty's glare to we cut to, which is really fabulous. Mm-hmm. Oh, so then okay. uh, you have uh, Laverne finished all studying with the cheat sheets and the Chinese yeah. warlord asking for surrender. And there's yeah. also I'm just stuffing paper down my blouse, not socks. Right. Yeah. I was going to say the socks call back. <laughs> wow. They've been bringing that up a lot lately. Yeah. What the hell? Uh, it's like we're very aware that Shirley has small boobs. We get it. We get it, producers. I mean, we get it. And it's, it's and it's a uh, thing. and it, it, and I noticed that some of the continuity you know bits of dialogue they're very they come off yeah. in that same you know th- th- to that same amount like they're they're very like teasy things that they they sort of almost like pick on the characters in a way which is a bit unfortunate and it's and it's it's more it's more than a little like okay yeah there's there's other there's other jokes you can make yeah. here yeah yeah uh, and then we get just like, you know ba- we just get slam the face with all these ethnic stereotypes then the event exactly Slammed. yep <laughs> in the face of all the ethnic stereotypes yep but uh but yeah i mean i gotta figure i mean <laughs> so maybe the it was the uh whoever decided about the ethnic stereotypes they're the ones with the sawdust in their brain ah, oh yeah that makes sense jesus christ yeah and i swear to god there's a gay joke in there oh yeah now there's a few there's yeah. there's probably a couple in there yeah it's just like really the tone is just all off and you know there's Shirley selling her out, her out her values for a vaguely handsome man. Yep. And wearing fur all over her body. Uh, I'm amazed Laverne makes it out of this party alive. Oh, yeah. To be real. Jesus Christ. Especially given that they were definitely getting pretty close to making a can, you know, making like some sort of cannibal joke or something just to like, you know, double down on their wow. racism. Ra- racism. Wow. Remember, this was the time when the Italians were doing yeah. all the cannibal and zombie movies yeah. back then. Yep, yep, yep. We are in Fulci land. Yep. The land of the Fulci. Fulci, Di- uh, Diodato, and Berlenzi, and et cetera. Yeah. Don't Google that yep, if you, if you, unless you know what you're going into, please folks. Don't, please don't turn your stomachs in this fine <laughs> afternoon. Um, <laughs> um, so the girls, uh, after they kiss the guys, they come home, they realize they're both phony balonies. Yeah. And completely. they keep making idiots themselves over guys, and they should stop doing this. It kind of feels weird to see Shirley pretzel herself like the Vern has been mm-hmm. this whole time. Yeah, and it, it just it doesn't it feels kind of off for her, but that's just moi. Uh, and Rhonda, I'm sure, will enjoy those fur pieces and drape them on her body or something. Yeah, <laughs> and and I'm a, I mean I'm surprised that like you know this is even after already it's the fur, find out he's a furrier. It's like. Uh... You know, and she even loses it, you know, really yeah. loudly. You know, why don't we double date on a baby seal hunt? And, you know, I would shoot him and <laughs> hang him in our den. Put your gun, away. we'll put your gun away. We don't have a den. Um, so, right next to the uh, portrait of uh, Laverne, <laughs> that at one point is upside down this season. Watch out for that. I noticed that. Yeah. I can't remember what episode, yeah. but yes, I did notice yeah. that. It moves around the apartment and it's uh, sometimes uh, sideways or upside down, or whatever. That's a set dress was having fun. Oh, God. And then, what are we thinking about these tails as ear warmers? Oh, my God. Uh, desperation. I can't imagine, like, doing that. They do have fur earmuffs. Those things do exist. Mm-hmm. But why the hey? Oh, God. I do not like fur and I, real fur. You know, obviously. I do not like real fur. I do not like the notion of shoving it into my ear. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. at one point, it was like Shirley was going to make a fur mask and make a fur out of it. It's like, no, sis. No, stop. <laughs> 
Stop, stop. <sighs> but integrity re- returns only to be dashed as the girls pretend they are like they're they can water ski. Yeah. It's it undercuts what's a really good real talk scene. Yeah. You know, that what is it? The uh, we're we're jokes when it comes to guys, we'll do anything for a guy. Why do we do it? Because we're afraid they won't like us. You mean we're scared to be ourselves? And the irony is that at the end, they just hate themselves to be, you know, after, you know, they feel basically they feel crummy afterward. Yeah. And it's basically undercut immediately. Yeah. Yeah. It's annoying. It's really, 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 really super annoying because uh, you have a catharsis here. Mm-hmm. The girls vow they will never do this and then they immediately do this. And it's not like the furrier guy in particular is much of a catch. Like for Jeffrey, I do it because Jeffrey C- A seems fun. They have chemistry. Uh, the language bobble is o- easy to overcome, mm-hmm. but lord. Amazingly, they do not die or break limbs, but they survive for- to live another day. When are we ever going to actually get water skiing in this show? We've we've mentioned water skiing and boating and lakes and stuff twice this season, and we still haven't seen any of it. We take very, very, very little advantage of the beach that is right outside the girls' doors, allegedly. Uh, in real life, um, Burbank is far from very the far. Yes, no, we we yeah. we've uh, we've looked this up just to see to confirm, and yeah, it's a uh, it's a ways yeah. out there. Yeah, but they've uh, they portrayed it as being close, right? So it's like we never have any beach party parodies, which we could totally have fun with. We never have like water skiing montages or anything. There's so much you could do. We just had Malibu Mansion, right? That's the only one. Yep, that's it. It's the only one, and it's like. We can have so much fun with this. We can do so much with this, and we don't get to. Like, eh. At least water skiing is an appreciable skill they can pick up and use. Mm-hmm. Like, yes. you know, the, the languages you can use. Uh, the furrier is just surely breaking her principles, and he's not worth it. This man is not worth it, is my observation. Mm-hmm. Very few men. <laughs> Actually, you know, <laughs> no. no, I don't think any man is worth is worth that. Not not the harming of, of small little furry animals like that. Yeah, yeah, nothing is. You could look, you could look like the handsomest man on the planet and you wouldn't be worthwhile but right? if you just if you're spending your spare time sticking uh doing terrible things i won't actually i won't say what happens to uh, animals that are killed for fur but it's not pleasant no it is not i know that it's not pleasant we won't describe it yeah. it's terrible it's, it's awful so yeah so it, so it yeah. makes this it it it's a weird this is going to be an interesting one to rate because i like the episode but yeah. at the same time it's got some yeah. big caveats yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a this is a mid leveler for me. Uh, do you want to go first? Should oh I no, no, first? no, no. We're not to ranking yet. We got it. We got. We have got to do oh. a, a writer, director, and actor notes for today because oh, I have go got notes it. for some folks. Okay, this is uh, Bob Howard's only Laverne and Shirley credit, but he was another Jack Parr program alum, which is probably how him and Gary knew each other. And his writing credits range from comedy to comedy. Uh, but he was at the time it was a, had been a story editor for a while on Happy Days from seventy eight to eighty one. Had written for Johnny Carson on four hundred and sixty four episodes, according to the IMDb credits. Uh, a couple of odd couple episodes, and would also go on to get credit for another thirty six episodes of Madam's Place in the nineteen eighties. Oh, Madam's Place! See, I when I was very 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 young, that was on Madam. God bless Madam. That that was that was so fun. I was I was marinating in old lady snark <laughs> in my youth. That 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 <laughs> explains a lot of why you're such a kick and such a blast. To be honest, yeah. I was like I was like mar- between my neighbors and Madam and Golden Girls. It's just like yeah, I was just marinating and Mama and Mama. Okay, so course, after after we record this pod, there there's something I need to then bring up to you. We'll 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 talk about after this, which relates to yeah, this, yeah. And, and, and it's very cool. Uh, so director Jack Winter behind the camera, um, long time no see, sort of. Now he uh, was, as we had mentioned before, he had um, done some writing for Laverne and Shirley in season two. And then ended up actually returning as a director. Uh, he had done High Price Dates and To Tell the Truth last season. Now he has two more to go, uh, so I won't go into too much detail. But it does seem like he sort of retired from show business. But he passed yeah. away at the age of 64 in 2006. So it may just be he doesn't have IMDb credits, but um, Jack Winter is a generic enough name. It might take me a little time to like track down anything else. But uh, but yeah, we'll get back to that. Okay, so actor notes. So. I'm not going to mention too much about Jeff Goldblum. I mean, we've already talked about how you know, he's already in Body Snatchers and the Big Chill and the Right Stuff are uh-huh. coming up uh, around, etc. So we have three uh, actors we can discuss, though. Thomas Calloway, who played Harold, the, the furrier, 
This guy was another working actor of his era. He'd been on a handful of shows before getting here to the California years, but he does end up staying as an actor, you know, active through the 80s and 90s. He was mostly in TV, Remington Steel, ALF, V, Airwolf, and yes, even Punky Brewster. So you get, you get another uh, Laverne and Shirley alum to end up there. Yep. But he ends up showing up in uh, Young Guns, Murphy Brown, Murder, She Wrote, and as well as the... Um, he returned for the 90s reboot of new new WKRP in Cincinnati as a different character, although he was also in the original uh, in 1979. So that's very neat. So if you've seen this guy, feel like you've seen this guy before, there's a reason for that. So this one was yeah. fun is uh, the Swedish man. Now, first of all, I want to mention the dude has got a doll's head in this episode on his jacket. I do not know why. I don't get that. But it's amazing. But this was uh, played by a guy named Rob Monroe. He ended up being a uh, TV guest regular with an episode here and there from like Private Benjamin, Webster, Murder, She Wrote, etc. Um, he got a bit of a regular part in the last season of Harry and the Hendersons and a pair of episodes of Trapper John, M.D. Uh, he ended up as a regular in the TV adaptation of Fudge in 1995. I don't know if any of you like oh. me grew up watching, reading the Fudge books as a kid. Oh, I, I idolized Judy Bloom. Ah, for multiple reasons. That, that's awesome. Okay. Here's the weird kicker about it. This guy ended up voicing the character of Jin in both the Fear Effect video games in the early 2000s. This is this is why I thought this was interesting to bring up. Now, for those who don't know Fear Effect, Fear Effect was one of those, like, we're trying to make it like a movie. It was very cinematic. It had a cel-shaded art style. It had a, um, it was trying to chase the whole um, sex sells uh, element of yeah. uh, marketing at the time that was popular with Tomb Raider. And so they uh, tried to make a sex symbol out of the protagonist in that game. Um, uh -huh. so, but this is, this is bizarre to like find that, you know, cause like I loved that game. I love the first one anyway. I never yeah. played the second one. And Jin was actually one of like my favorite characters. I was actually working on a fanfic about his character <laughs> when I was like, tw oh, when I was like 13. So this is, this is bizarre on multiple levels. And, and not to mention, of course, it's also, it's whitewash casting and a good, but a very obscure game. It's very strange. <laughs> It is a small world. Yeah. So Rob Monroe, that is definitely small, one I, I mean, of wow. all the video games, Fear Effect is not one that would have been on my bingo card. God, that is wild. And lastly, uh, in really front of the cool. camera is Heinrich, played by Wolf Muser. Uh, he was another actor on the cusp of a pretty, you know, massive career in show business. He was one of the leads in the 1975 horror flick Frozen Scream and an episode of Heart to Heart before this. But afterwards, he landed a ton of parts in 1982 from Barbarossa to Romance Theater to Cagney and Lacey. Now, the trend of staying ridiculously freaking busy seems to have not slowed down even to 2019, where he shows up as various comedian, comedic roles in Adam Ruins Everything and played oh. Adolf Hitler in The Man in the High Castle. That is a oh, that's great. Yeah, Man High Castle apparently uh, came out very well. Yeah, I have not watched that yet, but I have heard a lot about it. My father loves that. Yeah, I've I've, cool. I've heard like mixed. That's amazing. It's really cool. I, I've heard sort of mixed word about the show, but I mean that's that's me just getting into opinions and stuff. I liked the first couple episodes, but it's a case of where like I guess like after episode six or seven or something like that, they they finished the story, so they had to come up with their own new stuff after that. You know, yeah. that, they finished the novella basically, yeah. but. Yeah. Wolf Moser also was in Mel Brooks's remake of To Be or Not To Be, got a stint oh. on the soap opera Santa Barbara, as well as a ton of others. Hey. Now, I also want to give a quick shout out. Lisa, you're going to love this. He was in The Master with Lee Van Cleef and Timothy Van Patten in the episode Hostages. Yes. Oh. The George Lazenby one. Oh. <laughs> oh, that's cool. That's a ninja theme song. Anyway. Uh, the last bit of trivia about Wolf Merzer here is he was in the wacky Western produced Ultraman series Ultraman, the ultimate hero in the Dada episode, which if any of you are familiar with the Dada character makes it all the more amusing because Dada is fittingly very strange. And and yes, this yeah. is yet another actor who had an appearance of Murder, She Wrote and a Gabriel Knight video game. OK, that covers all the notes is that this was a fun one to research because there were so many weird twists and turns in the middle of that. But uh, yeah, that covers our behind the camera and in front of the camera notes. But um, yeah, um, I guess that brings us to ranking. So what what go ahead, yeah. go first. I'm curious. This is about uh, this is um, I'm going to say about a, f a five for me. It's middle of the heat. It's not it's mildly offensive to the characters, but. I'm almost tempted to give it to put it in, in a four ranking, but Jeff Goldblum's performance is just that strong. His chemistry with Penny is just that good. Hmm. And I like the Rhonda and the Shirley scene. Eh, it's 
about 4.5, I think, for me. Uh, there's some mildly funny antics of the racism, the, the betrayal of the girls' characters. I just can't go any higher. I, yeah, wow. That's lower than I, yeah, I mean, it's lower than I'm giving it, but I, but these are all understandable reasons. It's, it, it's very understandable based yeah. on your, your bugbear, I guess, so to speak, you know, about like the, because the, because this is one of those, like, it's an experience sort of thing that, you know, I was not a fan, obviously, of the elements that were problematic, you know, regarding the, uh, the, the character's values and the, the racism yeah. and et cetera, the casual racism. There was enough there for me, like, especially little details. Like, I even noticed, like, Jeff Goldblum, uh, his character bogarting the food from Laverne while they're watching uh, Shirley lose herself is, is, uh-huh. is, is funny. Um, there's some fantastic dialogue. You know, what is it? People in fur houses shouldn't throw stones. There, there are many details that I found cute. And so I'm actually going to give this, like, a five and a half, to be honest. Maybe a six. Perfect. Hmm, well, different structure, different folks. Really like it, you really liked it. Yeah. We, we've all got different reasons for liking what we like and being into what we're into. Yep. In the end. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That was good. That was a nice, good, big spirit here. But, uh, but yeah, so we're, wow, we're about at the halfway point for this show, aren't we? For this season, yeah. aren't we? Yeah, yeah. We're way past halfway point for the show. Yeah. Oh, yeah. If you're here listening to this now, you might as well stick around for season eight. <laughs> No, you're in it for the long haul with us. But yeah, past the halfway point. Get in, losers. We're going to season eight. Season eight. <laughs> We're going to be like Jim, James Cameron picking Bill Paxton up from his house to take him to go see Evil Dead 2. Which is an amazing story. I love that story. I love that story. <laughs> All right. But that covers that does uh, cover everything for today, I believe. Yep. 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 All right. So anyway, we'll have a quick word from our sponsor and uh, then we'll be back with a little bit of a post amble. And saying about what's coming up of right next with a one, two. Hey, hey, stick around. All right. Well, thank you again, everyone, so much for listening to us on Night After Night. And if you would like to know more, you can find us at Night After Night Pod on Tumblr, for Facebook, WordPress, Twitter. Uh, actually, technically, you can find us on Twitter there, but you mostly like YouTube, Patreon, that kind of stuff. But on Twitter, if you would like to get in touch with us a little more directly because we're more active on that platform, you can find us at Night F Night PC. Night After Night Podcast will hopefully also get you to where you need to go as well. Uh, with all that in mind, though, so uh, I feel this urge to go run up a flight of stairs while horns play on the soundtrack. Lisa, what do we got next? How about punching a side of beef? Maybe, yeah. Carmen decides to reach out and grab the brass ring by auditioning for a big boxing picture. With Squiggy Lenny and the also starring Rhonda's help, will he be able to make his big screen debut? This is Rocky Ragu. Ooh, I love Rocky Ragu. It's like it's got a real nice thick meat sauce there going. Oh, man. I love yeah. they actually make a spaghetti joke in this episode. They just <laughs> go for it. <laughs> yes, it's about freaking time. Uh, All right, well, join us next time and we'll see you there and... Uh, you know, just just remember, folks, don't don't pretzel yourself, partly because of the fact that some of us need gluten free food and um, hold on to your values. Oh, and fuck the fur industry. <laughs> don't twist yourself into a little tiny little, little little tiny little foldable packet because then all your blood will squish out. and That would be terrible. Yeah, you're, you're not. Or- also, yeah, you're not origami kids. Yeah. Also, for heaven's sake, if you are given fur. At least give it to somebody who needs it. You don't need fur. Or do you? After all, you might be a werewolf. Dun, dun, dun.